Hello and welcome to another edition of Long Beach Treasures. I'm your host, Harvey Keller, and today we're going to look at, indeed, a Long Beach treasure, Rancho uh, Los Alamitos. Not only is it a, his, uh, a Long Beach treasure, it's a national treasure because it's listed on the National Registry of Historic Places. My guest today is the Executive Director of the Rancho Los Alamitos, Pamela Seeger. Welcome, Pamela. Good morning, Harvey. I understand you're going to take us on a visual tour of the rancho? I thought we'd start with that and take a look and see what there is, just at this very treasured site. So. Hopefully we can roll some slides and take a look at the site itself. I'm ready if you are. A little walk through history. So let's begin. This is Rancho Los Alamitos. It's a very wonderful treasure. This is Gates in 1928. Um, it's a wonderful teaching tool to explore the relationship between people and place over time and how we change our environment. Its history stretches back to about 500 AD, which was the time of the first Native American settlement. After more than 1,200 years, as an important Native American trading and ceremonial center, in 1790, Rancho Los Alamitos became the largest land grant ever awarded by the Spanish and Mexican crown. And here you can see the land grant. It's about 300,000 acres. One of the owners, um, after the initial grantee, the Nieto family, left, um, one of the owners was Governor Figueroa, and he was followed in 1842 by Abel Stearns, who you see on the, uh, on the photo here. Abel Stearns was one of the wealthiest men in California at that time, and he purchased the 28,000 acres for about $6,000. The next important owner is John Bixby here, who purchased the ranch in 1881, showing how values have gone up for $125,000, and he set about making it a model Victorian home and farm. He came from Maine, and many of his eastern values and aesthetic began to shape the house and the landscape. Here you can see the back patio, or west side of the house, in 1887. Look particularly at how barren the landscape is. And in the background, you can see eucalyptus trees. That's a sign that exotic plant material from all over the world is beginning to come into the Southern California landscape. John Bixby was entrepreneurial and very successful. This is a barn that he purchased called the Big Red Barn from Phineas Banning, and it was originally part of the Civil War barracks over in Wilmington. John simply cut it up into pieces and hauled it over to Rancho Los Alamitos, and it stood as a local landmark on the hill there until 1947, when the barn burned. John Bixby died very suddenly at age 39. When he was old enough, his son Fred, who's on the left here, took over the ranch. Here he, here he is with his wife Florence, the diminutive woman beside him, and their five children on the South Drive in 1911. Note the pepper trees, we all call them California peppers, but actually they're native to Peru. Fred also cut up a house and brought it over to the rancho. Ranching at Rancho Los Alamitos was supported by oil revenues from strikes at Signal Hill and on ranch land. Fred's career as a rancher and businessman flourished, but he always knew. He told a reporter, there is nothing that makes a cow so fat as rubbing up against an oil derrick. As Fred's career flourished and funds were available, his wife Florence set about developing the gardens. She was relying, of course, on that natural resource oil. This is the back patio in 1928. It's the very epitome of a gracious and serene courtyard. The family used this back entrance most of the time. This is the uh, secret garden um, designed by the Olmsted brothers um, in 1928. It was a place where Florence could sit and play with her grandchildren, write poetry, and just enjoy the outside environment of Southern California. Almost all the plant material is non-native. This is the geranium walk, again in 1928. Um, as soon as the children were done with a pony pasture, Florence immediately swept up the land and made it part of her garden. This was done by Florence York, who designed the uh, sets for Gone with the Wind, one of Southern California's most prominent landscape designers and one of the few women. This is one of my favorite views of the rose garden looking out over the barley fields to the ocean and Catalina Island on the horizon. Again, designed by the Olmsted uh, firm. It would be wonderful, a gazebo here is truly for gazing outward as you sat there and looked at the open landscape beyond. This is the music patio, and it's a space that's truly reflective of indoor-outdoor classic Southern California living. Our mild Mediterranean climate, of course, makes that possible. And here you can see the furniture and sculptures and other items that have furnished this patio to make it an ideal place for sitting. 
This is an aerial view of the ranch in 1936. And you can see it's an oasis upon an open landscape with very few trees, very unlike this, the Southern California landscape we look at today. Curving driveway to the left led down to 7th Street, and that diagonal road was Anaheim, or the country road that went from downtown to Anaheim. How things have changed. This is the barnyard area today. In 1968, the remaining 7.5 uh, acres of the ranch became a public historic site through a gift of the property um, by the children of Fred and Florence Bixby. This is the barnyard today, and I think it shows how we've imposed a lush sense of the landscape on what was a barren open space. This is, the same is true of the dairy barn here, which is shown in a mo with a modern pink concrete path in front of it, and now has kind of a romantic rather than a working barn uh, look. The barn is reflective of traditions of Europe and the East, where sliding roofs were necessary for snow to come off the roof. But despite the park-like changes in the barns area, the house remains, as you can see here, at the heart of the site. It's evolved since around 1800 from a rudimentary adobe shelter to into a sprawling and comfortable ranch house. But through all those evolutions, it's always been home. And here we're walk coming in through the uh, formal entry on the east side of the house, an entry not often used by the family. As you can see, the adobe walls are overlaid with tongue and groove in the Victorian period, as you can see in the arches, and then again by the arts and crafts detailing around the arches. The billiard room, complete with billiard table, that forced the name and the function. The billiard table was originally a gift to the YMCA, but they felt it would lead young men into bad ways. Therefore, uh, it was hauled back to the ranch by John Bixby and demanded a billiard room to house it. The Indian rugs are clearly reflective of what Fred and Florence collected around their ranches from the trading posts in Arizona. This is the library, a room where the family spent most of their time in the evening. It's a room where today we can explore with children what makes a home. Um, is it the people? Is it the family? Is it the building? and how families have changed over time. The dining room is a good introduction to questions of different cultural foods, what we eat, why, when we eat, what it takes to put food on the table in Native American times compared to now where we can pop into a gas station and order a meal ready to microwave or eat on the way home. Clearly though, this is a formal dining room supported by the services of a cook. And here is the kitchen, um, often the heart of a home, but not really here, because the family rarely were in the kitchen. This was the cook's domain. It's a good place, though, for comparing and contrasting what we use to cook today, such as a microwave, compared to this wood-burning stove, or the earlier outdoor open fire. This is a view from the music room out to the music patio, and it demonstrates beautifully the flow between the indoors and the outdoors. There's a view of the garden from every room in the ranch house, even the bathrooms, again, blending that indoor-outdoor living, which is so, such a hallmark of how we live in Southern California. Art in the family was also very important, and Fred and Florence collected the kind of artwork that was fashionable during their day, yet the overall collection shows a really discerning and individual eye. This is a detail from the Monet water lily painting. You can see a reproduction today on the wall. The original was given to Florence by, uh, to the Los Angeles uh, County Museum of Art. And this is a piece by Frank Tenney Johnson, which you can see today in the library. He was a well-known uh, painter of nighttime and cowboy scenes. Um, and this is a particularly fine piece. And I encourage people to see that. Mostly the family collected uh, illustrations of the garden or of Western ranching or home and family. What to expect when you visit the historic garden today? This is a contemporary uh, image of the restored cutting garden. And of course, it depends upon the season. But what you will see are plants from around the world that have become the plant palette of today. Although there's much less variety of plant materials available when you go to the nurseries today than there was in Florence's time. Cactus gardens were very important in the 1920s. This one was laid out with the help of William Hertrick, who laid out the hunting estate in San Marino. And it's a very decorative and strong garden, quite unlike some of the softer, more feminine spaces elsewhere in the garden. This is a contemporary view of the restored geranium walk uh, in the early morning. As with all the gardens, the time of day can completely change the character of the landscape and the quality of the light, making it either very contemplative, as it is here, or a very vibrant space um, full of color and uh, changing shadow. 
This is the restored rose garden. It was completed two years ago and is now maturing out nicely um, as the old-fashioned roses gain vigor and uh, gain color. The planting plan is centered around a sundial, which you can't quite see here, but the roses pick up the color of the dial and then radiate that color out toward the edges of the garden. Just like plants, animals bring a reality to our barnyard area and help us explore our changing relationship with them. In our urban environment, animals today are really for, not for work or food, but as pets. This is Big John, our favorite Belgian, with a few chickens in the front. He does as little work as possible if he can avoid it. The site also presents free educational programs that focus on different aspects of the history or nature of Rancho Los Alamitos and our community. These are dancers, young dancers, keeping alive the tradition uh, in a Hispanic heritage program. The next image is from the Native American program. Um, we do both Native American programming and also a children's workshop on Native American culture, which is taught by Native Americans for us. The programs are important in introducing non-museum audiences to the site and also in allowing us to learn about and celebrate the entire span of our history and also the different cultures. Uh, this slide is from one of the Christmas programs. Uh, where actors are used to portray characters in the house of a certain period. The script is based on actual events of the day. And we find overall drama is a very uh, useful vehicle for communicating in a direct and conversational manner. And it's just one of the tools available to us. Mrs. Bixby uh, really loved her gardens. And she uh, thought that the gardens were by nature informal and personal. And she made her gardens very personal. The indoor-outdoor concept at the Rancho, another concept that was very prevalent uh, during the Bixby's time, because movement from uh, indoors to exactly. outdoors was just a matter of space uh, at, the, at the Rancho. Exactly, just a, mace, a, a case of stepping through a doorway or through a window, and then you are in the open environment. Um, and those spaces flowed very easily. The family entertained outside. It didn't sit in the sun as much as people do today. It was dappled space with some shade for reading and just enjoying the very temperate Mediterranean climate we have, which of course made that possible. The gardens also uh, offered a return to the land as a place for a physical and a spiritual uh, uh, retreat. Uh. And, and they still are. I think they still perform that function because today they're still um, kind of an oasis in a very urban environment. And that tranquility gives us all a chance to step back and take a deep breath. There's a little more space than we have in our gardens at home. And so it's a very refreshing and renewing experience. One of the reasons we don't routinely do tours of the garden, which you as a docent know, we want people to have that chance to just be alone and take from the garden what they would like to have and what they need at a particular time. I think if I really had a really bad day sometime, I would just grab a book, drive up the hill, and sit in the garden and read for a little while. And I know I would go away and I would be happy once again right. because it's so relaxing and if, if a jet doesn't go over you're going to swear that you're in a different time and place than the uh, uh, year 2000. Right, but actually I think sometimes a jet going over reminds you just how valuable that space is because we've used up so much more of our open space today that that's kind of for me a reminder that we have to care for the treasures that we have and really make sure they're there and preserved for everyone for the future. You described the rancho so beautifully, it makes me want to go up there this afternoon <laughs> and, and just walk around again. Right. We only have about one minute uh, until we have to take a break, and when we come back, I want uh, to talk to you uh, about uh, the uh, master plan that you have developed for the rancho, because I think this is going to create uh, some very uh, exciting times uh, at the rancho. I know when I went through my docent training up there, why it was hot in the cow barn where we met, uh, or either it's in the winter and it's cold and you have to bring in portable heaters, or if it's not the heat and the cold, it's the flies. So uh, it's, it's a little unusual to have a board meeting with uh, flies buzzing around and a chicken walking through, <laughs> but I must admit everybody handles it very nicely, but we're anxious to make uh, a better teaching tool of the, of the entire site, and so it's a very exciting time. Oh, I think it will be. I think it's going to be tremendous. Uh, I think we're just about ready to go to break, so uh, we'll be right back. Oh, 
Hola, amigos. We're Culture Clash, and our parents took us to the theater. And you know what? We got hooked. During Kids Week at the theater, if an adult buys a ticket to a show, they can bring two kids for free. There's backstage tours and classes in combat and Shakespeare. So adults, get off your bums and show some kids the magic of theater. Yeah. Kids kick an adult in the ankle till they take you. <laughs> that's what worked for us. Oh, delay. Kids Week at the theater, April 30th through May 7th. Call 310-281-1910 or go to kidsweek.org. Charter Communications is embarking on an extensive construction project to upgrade your cable system with fiber optic technology. During construction, you may experience temporary interruptions of service, however, not during the evening hours. If you'd like to contact us about the upgrade in your area, call our hotline at 1-877-FIBER-UP. We are working hard in deploying this exciting new technology to continue to bring you the cutting edge in entertainment and communication services. To keep you informed, I'll be bringing you updates as this project progresses. Fourth graders in the Long Beach public school system are, are quite lucky and fortunate because when they're in the fourth grade and they're studying California history, they get to come up to the rancho and go on a tour, which is a valuable tool in their educational process. And education is a valuable part of the rancho activities, is it not? I would say it's actually at the heart of the activities, um, Harvey. We, we believe our basic mission is actually public education. In, the very broadest sense of the word and um, we've done a great deal of work with at the fourth grade level to ensure that what we're presenting at the fourth grade meets the testing standards and content standards at the state and local level and we've had as an ex-teacher I'm sure you appreciate we've had wonderful mentor teachers involved and curriculum people from the school district and in fact the fourth grade tour has won three awards a national uh, local and regional in the last year and it's a very exciting program. It's a little different to teaching straight history and that we're primarily interested in the relationship between people and place. Um, and that is the kind of theme that's woven through um, the school tour. The name of the tour is Footprints on the Land and we're looking at footprints of people and buildings and animals and plant materials and people who've come to the site. So it makes it a very dynamic way that's not locked into a single time frame but can move across all time periods and all cultures by using universal themes such as home and family and environment and work and play. And um, that makes it possible to bring it alive to a child for whom otherwise the rancho might um, signify a white rich person's home. But once you start talking about the meaning of home, uh, once you start talking about how we relate to animals, you start talking about why do people settle here um, how do they make a place home? Then you begin to get at issues that are the same for any culture, uh, no matter what time period. And from 500 A.D. to the present, many <laughs> people have left their footprints upon the land at they, Rancho Los Alamitos. They certainly have, and in fact, as part of the school tour, we want uh, the children that come to understand and know that the ranch is part of their heritage and it belongs to them. And so when they're in the library, um, they take a Polaroid of their class in the library and it goes into an album and that they have put their footprint on, uh, on Rancho Los Alamitos and we hope that will endure for a very long time for them. So it's kind of a nice, nice way to have them feel included and have the site come close to them and not be an aloof place for them to visit. Uh, there are many materials associated um, with the school tour. We think uh, children learn better by touching things, but we have to draw a line between what you can and cannot touch, as you know, in the ranch house. So we have touch baskets, and this is one here that um, is from the Rose Garden, and it uh, deals with issues of uh, we need water and plants need water, but we li live in an arid environment. The rancho was settled where it was because there was a natural spring. And so water is terribly important to us in Southern California as it is to our plant materials. So we can look at well, how much water is there in the soil and where did the water come from. Um, another issue is what about views? How have they changed? Well in that wonderful historic photograph that we looked at on the slideshow, you could look out over the fields to the ocean. What can we see now? We can see a screen of uh, trees because there's housing directly on the other side, and that's what's happened in Southern California. We had to always um, worry about pests in the garden eating our plants, and so Florence Bixby used ant traps just like this, <laughs> uh, which of course had sticky stuff inside. Today we're a little bit more chemically oriented, so we do things differently, but we still have the same problems. Different times of year, we can look at the temperature, 
and see what is the temperature where we are now, um, how does it differ. Um, the temperature means that we can grow roses at odd times in the year when uh, on the east coast they are uh, under frost conditions. And then plants, seeds, what have we brought out of this little selection of seed packets? Uh, all of them are non-native except of course for our California poppy which gives you a sense and the children a sense of how much we've changed the landscape uh, based on what we like to see in the landscape, not necessarily what is native uh, to the landscape. Another component which is quite new is the uh, Native American Children's Program, uh, which again, as I said, is taught by Craig Torres of the Native American community. And the Native American community made many of the artifacts. This is a musical instrument. It's a clapper stick. You're going to do a concert used. for it? <laughs> well, you could use it to keep me in line. Too. <laughs> um, a class of stick, which is uh, one, all made of natural resources, because that's what they had to work with. So everything that is used uh, comes from the environment around them. But of course, Pavunga was a, an important trading center. So this, which is a tool, um, has obsidian, which clearly they would have had to have traded, uh, probably from the area of the Salton Sea, uh, with wood and uh, pitch to, to hold it in place with some binding here. Uh, this is another item, a hook made out of bone, um, again with um, pitch to keep it in place, beautifully crafted. That um, might have been used as a fish hook. It, it could have been, although there are other fish hooks too for smaller fish that are kind of curved and a little bit more flexible. But everything came from the land, and so it's important to look at how people could live from the land versus how we live today, which is certainly not from the land. Um, the school tour has uh, items that are, that are sent to the school children or to the teacher in advance, which gives them a sense of the footprint that we're going to be discovering, looking for evidence um, of different cultures on the land at Rancho Los Alamitos. And then it has some preparatory materials, a timeline, the evidence you're going to find on site, and what was going on elsewhere in the world. So it makes a very nice package. So the teachers have a lesson plan to prepare before they get up to the rancho to sort of... They, they do indeed. And a new um, component under, under uh, development, so you're seeing the first draft, will be an explorer's program where um, we'll use mapping um, to teach skills of critical evaluation and cartography. Um, the children have clue cards and then an explorer's sheet where they fill in uh, the evidence that they've found on site that might let them know how much plant material is native versus a newcomer, how you figure out where you are in California, which is this section uh, right here. And then they fill in their findings, take it back to the classroom, and uh, evaluate what they found, again with an idea of how things changed, why have they changed. They use the historic views at the bottom, and then they look and see for themselves uh, what has changed and why it's changed. So it's a very nice program that's coming along under development. I bet they can't wait to get into the fourth grade just so they can get <laughs> up to the rancho. Right, but we don't also always teach just at fourth grade, although that's when California history is mandated, so that that's by and large where we focus. But we also run the, gum, run, uh, run the gamut because we teach for uh, preservation courses for USC and UCLA and Cal Poly Pomona, but there we're teaching landscape interpretation and restoration, um, and we're a case study for those courses. So it's the whole, uh, whole gamut, and we've done several programs uh, teaching teachers of cultural geography how to use a historic site as a primary resource. So in that instance, we're reaching many more children through the teachers that we're working with. Now, I don't want us to run out of time, and I <laughs> want to hear about this uh, master plan that you have uh, and uh, what this is going to incorporate and how it's going to change the rancho for the better, I must add. <laughs> yes, um, it certainly will. Um, it, it is just within the barnyard area, and uh, it's a master plan we developed in 1989 uh, with the support of the city. Um, we've developed it. We've now, we are now finally ready to move toward implementation. Um, it will change that lush landscape that we looked at um, in the slides to a more working ranch character, which will make a perfect foil against the very lush gardens and uh, illustrate that difference between the working landscape and the designed landscape. It will move the barns back into positions that are not the little circle they were put in in 1968, but have much more to do with how they were positioned as working structures. And we will also do an adaptive reuse and an extension to the 1947 horse barn, which has already been altered significantly 
to add um, visitor arrival and exhibit space, um, a multi-purpose room for exhibits and for teaching and for lectures. Um, and uh, we are able then also to take staff out of the historic areas in the ranch house and put them in a hidden basement underneath that extension, which means we can restore and open up another 2,000 square feet for the public in the historic ranch house complex. So it's very exciting. Um, it has some very uh, wonderful and unique design ideas on the interior that I think will make it um, an even better treasure for the city of Long Beach. Now, do you expect uh, to increase the number of public programs? Do you expect uh, a large uh, influx of uh, a tourist to... Uh... No, uh, no on several fronts. Tourism market is not a market that we actively go after. We're interested in serving people within a 15 to 30 mile radius of the ranch. Um, this space is not designed for to increase the number of visitors. In fact, we're reducing the parking. We're interested in a quality visit and we're interested in um, having good interior spaces that will enable us to teach year round, which we can't do right now. There will be um, uh, additional visitors as a result of normal growth over time, the two or three percent that we grow each year, but uh, no, no plans for dramatic visitor expansion at all. And this will come up in front of the City Council sometime uh, in the future? I would think toward early summer, um, and then we will move ahead from there. We've been extremely fortunate um, in the fundraising, as I'm sure you read recently. I just saw you got a million dollars. We did, we did. And other major foundations have been extremely uh, kind to the project. So we have a goal of about four and a half million dollars, and we're almost at the three million dollar stage. So we're very excited. Um, and uh, we think it can be a very beautiful project that will enhance the ranch uh, and its capability of serving people uh, for the next uh, 20 to 50 years very easily. We only have one minute left, and I do want to thank you, Pamela. I thought this is most in entertaining and thank educational, you. and I hope people will take advantage and go up to the rancho and see what a treasure we do have in Long Beach. Especially since it's free. Absolutely, it's free. Yeah, and all of the public programs are free, too. So Next month, we're going to take a look at uh, Bluff Park, uh, so you'll want to uh, tune in for that. And in the uh, following months, we'll take other walks through history and see uh, other Long Beach treasures. So we thank you for joining us uh, on Long Beach treasures. And again, we hope you enjoy the program as much as we enjoy bringing them to you. Because I'm learning an awful lot about Long Beach and um, the history of Long Beach and all of the treasures that we have here. This is really a great city, and I'm so proud to be a part of it. So again, thank you, and uh, maybe someday you'll come back and uh, visit us once again. Thank you very much. All right, I think that's just about it, and uh, we'll see you again uh, at our next show. So thank you for watching, and join us again when we take another walk through history and discover more Long Beach treasures. <laughs>